Welcome to another episode of Culinary School Stories, the bi-weekly podcast that is dedicated to sharing the stories of people around the globe whose lives have been influenced, impacted, touched, and or enriched, for good or for bad, from their culinary school experience. Hi, my name is Colin Roach and I'm your host. Thanks for joining us today. You are an important part of this show where we ask the question, what's your culinary school story? So now, without any further delay, let's meet today's guest. And a big welcome to all of you to the very, very, very first episode of the Culinary School Stories podcast. And that opening that we just heard is what will be the opening for every episode. So I hope you liked it. And I can't believe this is episode number one, that it's finally here. I've been talking about doing this podcast for a long time. I can remember talking about the idea over a year ago with a few people. Now, I don't usually wait that long to take action for something as exciting as a podcast, but I was swamped with my other podcasts, my YouTube channel, my teaching, research, other projects, and of course, family. But wait no longer, it is finally here. And I'm so glad that you are here as well. Thanks for listening today. Now today's episode is going to be a little bit different from the norm because I'm going to first give a quick introduction on who I am as the host of the show. And second, I want to introduce the podcast and talk about the format before we get to today's guest. So let's start right out with who I am. For those who don't know me yet, my name is Colin Roach, and I am the host of Culinary School Stories. With years of experience as a professional chef and culinary arts professor, it is my joy and privilege to get to share these stories. In addition to this podcast, I also have another one that I started about a year ago that is titled The Chef Educator, which was created to be a comprehensive resource for new and seasoned culinary, baking and pastry, and hospitality teachers, instructors, and faculty at both secondary and post-secondary educational institutions. The show addresses the many issues related to student learning and instructor effectiveness, and the hope was to offer a collection of practical and effective teaching tools, tips, and techniques that we can use in our classrooms and our labs. And if that is of interest, please be sure to check it out, and you can subscribe to the podcast at www.chefeducator.com. Now, I also host and produce a couple of YouTube channels, with the most popular being Wicked Easy Cooking. To find out about that show or any of my other channels, just log on to YouTube and type in Dr. Professor Chef, or my name for that matter. You can do that into the search bar and it should pop right up. Dr. Professor Chef is the name of my production company that everything sort of falls underneath. It's kind of the umbrella company, which actually Dr. Professor Chef started as a nickname that many of my students started calling me. Now, I also realize that many of you may be listening to this right now in the car, at the gym, maybe you're out for a jog, or someplace else that would make it very hard, if not impossible, to write all these links and information down, so no worries. I will put everything in the show notes so that you can get them all later. And another easy way to get everything is just go to my website at chefroach.com, chef, R-O-C-H-E dot com, which is where I house all of what I do. You may have to do a little searching, but it is all there under different tabs and under different windows, and so you can find it easily enough. So now let me tell you about the podcast. One of the taglines of the show is, tell me your culinary story and I will tell the world. And the other is, talking out of school. Now these are both appropriate because culinary school stories is all about the guests' culinary school experiences and stories. And the purpose of this podcast is to hear all about their personal culinary school journey in and outside of school and to share those insights and stories with you. Our aim is to interview today's most interesting and authentic culinary school students, alumni, faculty, and even administrators. And through a conversation, we put a spotlight on their story with the hope that it will not only inspire and entertain, but it may even be a learning experience for our listeners. I mean, if you want to know about a certain culinary school or get an insider's perspective, then the information that our guests will be sharing would be super valuable for someone. And I am going to be asking all of my guests a few standard questions just to get the ball rolling, like, 
why they wanted to go to culinary school in the first place and why they ended up choosing the specific culinary school that they did. I'll also ask things like, what was their most favorite class? What was their worst class? And more importantly, why were they their favorite or their worst? Of course, we're going to find out what they are doing now and how culinary school may have had an influence on their career path. We also want to know, was culinary school worth it for them? And would they do it again if they had the opportunity or would they, or would they make changes? We like to think of the interview as more of a conversation. So we start out with these general questions, kind of like an outline for the show. However, not every conversation will follow it exactly. We kind of go with the flow and wherever the conversation takes us. Our entire podcast is about culinary school stories, the specific culinary school story of that particular guest from their perspective, their point of view. And the big thing is we get real here. Our guests are not afraid to be vulnerable, to laugh, to cry, to yell. It's all good. This is not some stuffy podcast meant to bore the pants off listeners, but rather to give you, the audience, an oral history of the guest's culinary journey. And we have already heard from our guests that this archive of their stories is a priceless keepsake and a way to give back to those that may come after them. They share their story with the world as entertainment, but also to maybe inspire and motivate others. So Culinary School Stories podcast is going to be a weekly, maybe a bi-weekly. It depends on how busy I am, but we're going to try for weekly to start. It's a podcast with engaging interviews that shares the stories of people around the world. Because I've had some people from New Zealand, from Ireland and England that I'm interviewing that have an association with a culinary school in some way. Now, each episode, we're going to bring you, you know, the best stories, as I mentioned, from around the food service world, from people who have been impacted, influenced, and are exposed positively or negatively, directly or indirectly, for good or for bad, from their culinary school experience. And this podcast is dedicated to telling their story. And if that describes you, we would love to have you on the show. If you want to share your culinary school story in a future episode, all you have to do is go to www.culinaryschoolstories.com. All one word, culinaryschoolstories.com. And then there, there's a questionnaire that you will download and fill out, the guest questionnaire. It's kind of at the bottom of the page. And then you'll send that back to us. And after we receive it, we'll be back in touch to set up a day and a time to chat and set up your interview. And of course, if you haven't yet subscribed to the show, please do that now. And I want to also give a big thank you to everybody who has already left a review and a rating on Apple Podcast. Show hasn't even been released yet, just the trailer, and already we're getting favorable reviews. So thank you so much for that. That is really the quickest way of convincing others to listen and to build this show. For those that haven't, I will leave a link in the show notes to Apple Podcasts so that if you're interested after listening to this episode or future episodes and leaving a positive review, you'll have easy access to the link to do that. We really appreciate everyone's support and review of Culinary School Stories. We are looking for sponsors to financially support the show and help us defer some of our costs. Individuals can do that for as little as a, a dollar a week through our Patreon account. And if you are a company that fits well with our audience or know someone who owns a company that would be a great fit, we would love to talk to you. So lastly, culinary school students, faculty, and administrators are inspiring. They overcome challenges, they are leaders, and they have great stories to tell. Therefore, without any further delay, let's start this first episode where we ask our guest, what's your culinary school story? My guest today was born and raised in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where he developed a passion for culinary arts while in high school. He soon moved to Miami to attend Johnson & Wales University, where he earned his bachelor's degree in culinary arts. While at JWU, he immersed himself in school activities and became a member of the leadership team, the special functions team, and the collegiate ambassador team. After graduation, he enlisted in the United States Army Reserve as a food service specialist, where he worked his way up to the rank of food service warrant officer. 
With multiple overseas and stateside deployments under his belt, he currently serves as the food advisor for the 518th Sustainment Brigade in Knightsdale, North Carolina. In 2016, he graduated from Pennsylvania State University with a master's in homeland security, agricultural biosecurity, and food defense. Married with three children, it is his oldest son, Ty, who inspired him to launch his newest entrepreneurial venture, Hot Sugar Pops. Let's welcome our guest, Mr. Will Glass. Okay, I'm so excited to be with you all today. My guest has a great culinary school story. So I want to say thank you, Will, for being on the show and sharing your story and welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. So let's start right out with a question. I know you went to school at Johnson & Wales Miami campus. Why did you pick that campus? Well, first, why did you go to want to go to culinary school? Then why did you pick that campus? Um, and what made you want to uh, choose Miami? Well, the, you know, the power of a high school guidance counselor. I took food service as an elective in high school um, in, in the, the food service class, prepared uh, lunch for the teachers. And I was kind of like the star of the, of, of the class. Um, and when I, when I got to my senior year, I had enough credits to graduate. Um, but I took three food service classes, gym and English. That was all I needed to graduate. So I was always uh, in the kitchen and uh, the guidance counselor came in and she said, hey, have you thought about this school? And Johnson and Wells was the only school I applied to. And my mother and I went down on the fly-in program um, where I met uh, Chef Hensley uh, for the first time. He was there for that for that fly in, and I had never been to the beach before, so it was it was it was, it was an easy choice. So we went down there, uh, had a lot of fun, and you know you know I'm from Pittsburgh, and you know at the time I had a really good job uh, actually in radio. Um, I was a I was a board operator slash producer for the radio station um, WAMO, um, and everybody thought I was going to go into broadcasting and journalism, um, but I really just liked cooking and. Um, just, just uh, I understood early, you know, that the power of food, you know, everything revolves around food, birthdays, weddings, you know, every occasion revolves around food. So I decided, uh, hey, well, let's just let's give it a try. My counselor, um, food service teacher in, at that school really believed in me. So, you know, I had I packed my bags and headed to Florida. So it was, you know, it was one of the best decisions uh, ever made. Had a great time. Um, and you went to, you took a high school culinary arts program for what, while you were in high school? Right. So in, in Pittsburgh, the, 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 each city school base had a specialty and the school I went to, their focus was hospitality. So we had a robust hospitality program. I, I was really close with the, uh, with the instructor. And um, so I went to our class and, you know, just, just learn the basics based on basic knife skills, some other sauces and, you know, some basic techniques. We didn't have a whole lot of high end equipment um, that, you know, I was exposed to when I got to school, but uh, it was fun and I enjoyed it. It was a little bit different when, when I got to school. <laughs> <laughs> when you got to Johnson and Wales? Right, it was a little, you know, a little bit different, you know, uh, but, but nonetheless, it was still, it was still fun. It was still fun. Tell me about that first day when you arrived on campus as a student, you know, share with the listeners, what was going through your mind? I'm sure you were probably excited, nervous. Um, what'd you think, you know, walking in? Is there anything you wish you had known before you got there? You know, kind of share with that, that first day. Well, surprisingly, because of the fly-in, I, I was really comfortable. You know, it, was, it wasn't like my first time. When I, when I got there, checked in, you know, some of the students that was there on the fly-in was there. So, we, you know, you know, I wasn't reintroducing re myself. So we kind of hung out, you know, the one, one guy that I met there, we became roommates. So I didn't have the awkward, you know, moment of you're meeting your roommate for the first time. But my first class, uh, nutrition and sensory analysis, was with Chef Osga. 
I, I, I realized like my very first lab that okay, I really don't know that much about food. <laughs> so I really don't know that much about food service. You know, you know, once once it was time to, to move into production, everybody's cooking and flipping and sauteing, and I really really didn't kind of have that yet. But you know, Chef Oscar was a great instructor, and it was his wife who who helped me become. Um, a student staff member there, you know, he's, you know, he, and he kind of mentored me up until I graduated, but that first class it was like, okay, there's a lot I need to learn. And that's what really pushed me to be so really engaged in what was going on on campus because, you know, after the first lab, I said, okay, I'm gonna go to the job. Let me go to the job here. So, you know, everybody talks about experience, you know, experience, experience, experience. So I go out and I hit up Aventura Mall and some of the local places and just didn't get hired. And I was a little, you know, kind of discouraged. So I just really decided to just uh, submerge myself in everything going on on campus. And that was turned out to be a lot of fun. So I, I did anything on campus I did the whole time I was there. Um, it was great. great. It was, it was a great experience. Yeah, tell us about that because you were involved in a lot of different things there. You know, the and tell us, tell the listeners what those clubs or those positions, like the special functions team and the collegiate ambassador, what those were, and and why it's beneficial if someone does go to culinary school to get involved with these type of you know organizations or clubs or committees, and on how it helps you in the future. You know, it's it's set up. You know, with the chef of the day your junior, I mean, your freshman and sophomore year to kind of learn or kind of develop those managerial skills that, that you'll need. Um, because you realize once you are on industry that the food service and the hospitality industry is this is very unique. And, you know, everybody knows it's a little crazy. You know, I tell everybody who wants to know what life is like, you just go read Kitchen Confidential. Um, it's very accurate. But when I joined, when I, when I came a part of the special functions team, you just learn, you know, organization, organizational skills, and you learn how the different departments uh, come together uh, to make an event on campus successful. So you have the special functions team, which pretty much we, if there's an event like an open house uh, or a fly-in or a, a distinguished visiting chef or something like that, you have a, a team of students who volunteer to just work the event. And, you know, you have a, an instructor that, you know, is usually running the event. And, you know, you basically, it's almost like another class, but there's really no pressure. You know, you're just, it's really the time to ask questions and really bounce ideas off of your classmates to have a little more experience than you do. And then with, so that's what this basically, did not show what the special functions team was. Um, and then the Ecclesian Ambassador team is just kind of for, mostly for the, um, business students, um, they do the tours and, and, and things like that when, again, they have an open house or any type of fly-in or any, any, anything going on, whether they, when, when they have the student fairs and things like that, they pretty much run point. Well, that department will run point and then those students will kind of assist those department heads with different tasks and duties. So again, you see what happens behind the scenes, you see what it takes Besides, you know, your skills, your your culinary skill set to really, again, make an event successful. So that's what the Collegiate Ambassador team was. And then in Miami at the time, this was this is 1998. So I believe in Providence, it was called a teaching assistant, but in Miami, it was called a leadership team. So leadership team was just a group of students that were staff members which are student employees, um, and they would work in the storeroom, quantity uh, kitchen. Um, assisting with the dinner meals um, after the, after the lab ended, um, they, they were working in the culinary office, so they just performed um, different duties. So I worked as a TA, and that was also uh, also a great experience. Mm -hmm. So let's think about the best class and your worst class. You know, go back. The curriculum's changed a few times, but you know, what was the class or the topic of it, and and why? Why was it your best? Why was it your worst? Uh, you know, I, I, I really didn't have any, any classes I, di I didn't like, but I, I would say, you know, uh, Chef Tanova had a, a big influence on me. I don't even know if he knows this, but Chef Tanova had a big influence on me. I had him for four classes. Um, I had him for freshman year. I had him for American. 
I had them for stocks and sauces. I had, then I had them for Garmage. Somehow I, I didn't get Chef Brandenburg for that, but I had Chef Tenova for Garmage. And then I had them for uh, sanitation and, and academics. So, and, and Chef Tenova had a very unique teaching style. And it, it was, you know, he just, he wasn't the typical instructor there, you know, and I knew all of them. And he, he, he was very different um, from, from them. And he just did things, you know, like, like for example, uh, uh, one day we were in American and we, we, we go in, he does the lecture, you know, we start production. And about 15 minutes into production, he just says, hey, everybody stop. And he writes these six words on the board. And he's, and he's like, uh, go to a library and go look up these words. <laughs> right. So we're all, you know, like what is going on, you know, because, you know, we, we have to get the, the meal out for dining room service. Right. So he, so we all, we all have to leave. We all run to the library, you know, which, you know, is down, you know, almost, I guess like a block or so look up the word, we find the words, get the words, come back and the lab is locked. And so he comes like strolling around the corner, unlocks the lab and is like, okay, you guys can finish. And we got about 20 minutes and everybody, it, 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 it was, it was, it was chaos that day, right? It was hilarious though. And what, what he told us was in the end, he said, um, your hotel or your restaurant just had a fire and you guys had to stop, but the event that's happening in the hotel is still going on. So you guys got to finish. That's basically what happened today in the lab. And he, was, he wasn't really worried about the meal. He was worried about how we were going to react, you know, but nobody did that. That was, I mean, nobody even did anything like that in class. One time, you know, um, I was making something and I had to conquer say a tomato and he walked over like looked in my ice bath and like took the tomato and just threw it against the wall. It just splattered. <laughs> like um, you, you, um, you, you uh, blanched out too long and just like walked away. Out of the ordinary, huh? <laughs> you know, and I remember, you know, like even in like stocks and sauces, uh, you know, there's a lot in that class. You know, you're learning your knife cuts, you know, you're measuring, you know, you're learning all these different mother sauces and their derivatives and you're learning how to, you know, clarify stuff. And, you know, he made it seem like there was so much that's going to be involved in this test for the practical. And he just, you know, I remember he, he just pulled me outside and he said, um, tell me how do you make chicken soup? I was like, what? He was like, how do you make chicken soup? <laughs> and I'm like, you know, and I just go through the process and make, you know, obviously from scratch, you know, but I had to, and then he, he listened and he was like, okay, go to the next guy to come in, come outside, <laughs> you know, but he, he, was, I mean, he was, he was really, you know, he was just, you know, if something was messed up, he just told you, you know, or he wouldn't tell you, but he was just an interesting, interesting guy. And then um, one time I had Chef Brandenburg for two classes and, um, I had to make rice pilaf. That was all I do, rice pilaf. You know, I get the rondo, you know, you know, sauteed onion and the garlic, you know, I had the rice, you know, I coated some oil, some fat, you know, um, add some stock, cover it, throw, toss it in the oven, you know, and I'm helping somebody else or whatever. And I remember I was at the range and um, I, I pull it out the oven and he just turns around, looks at it, and he was like, you got too much stock in that, throw it away. Wow. And I was like, throw it away. And he grabbed the pot and just threw it. Like across the room? Across, across into the <laughs> dish area, just threw it. And I was like, you know, I'm in shock, you know, and then, you know, he has somebody get him another rondo and he's about to make the rice again. <laughs> and then he kicks me out the class. He's like, this, this <laughs> right? But, but I wouldn't, but I didn't leave. I didn't leave. I stayed right there. Um, and, you know, I made it again with him. Um, he was like elbowing me out the way, I remember. But both of those instructors, you know, I got to know very well. Um, I did a lot of ice carving with Chef Brandenburg on the side. But Conor, you know, I don't know if, if, if people like too many people have those episodes like I, like I had uh, with a lot of the instructors, you know. And, and then when I, when I joined the military as a food service specialist, I was, used to, I was used to that. Like, it was like, this is nothing. Like, okay, like, you know, I was one of few. Yeah, tell, tell us about that because the culinary is based on a brigade system, which is like the military. Right. So, you know, the lineups you would have and check your uniforms and, you know, the discipline and the higher levels, professionalism. So maybe 
you could share how how is that similar is it similar how is it different exactly the same so when i graduated with my associates that summer in august i shipped out to basic joined as a food service specialist and when you're in class it's it's a lot like the military you know you have your inspections you know you line up you know checking your chef whites you know we call them chef whites um you know, nails, everything, you know, and, and the system is set up, you know, where you have the food service NCO, uh, who is basically, I guess, kind of functioning as, you know, like the executive chef. And then you have a first cook, which would be similar to like a sous chef, you know, and then you have the rest of the specialists. And that's basically how the dining facility is managed. So but a lot of our processes um, are exactly the same. And just the high pressure environment, you know, it's the same, you know, um, and I tell people in the military, you know, like food service is one of the most difficult jobs only because people will see your product every day. You know, if you're if you are a bad man and you and you do paperwork or memos, you know, if, if your grammar isn't correct, you know, they'll, they'll fix that. You know, the commander will fix that before they sign it, you know, but if you burn something, <laughs> you know, you're going to walk in. <laughs> Can't save that. Everybody's. Oh, you know, okay, you know, this was messed up. And the same thing in class, you know, it's a lot of pressure because, you know, everybody wants to be good, but it's it's, it's exactly the same. I mean, now I'm a food service warrant officer, so the scope of my job is a lot different. You know, I went from being the guy on the ground who's actually feeding you, putting the grits on your plate, to the one who now orders 10 connexes of grits for multiple units. So, you know, I, I pretty much oversee now the whole food service distribution system, you know, like on my last deployment, I was responsible for the whole theater distribution of rations. So it's a little bit different now, but those experiences though, that I mentioned previously with being on a leadership team, kind of, kind of young and, you know, being with the special functions team, um, it, you know, it really, it really helped because, <clears throat> you know, you're, you know, you, you get to spend time with the executives of the university, you know, on a regular basis, you know, they're coming down, they're checking things out and, uh, you know, you're having conversations with them. You kind of take that same approach to, okay, you kind of understand, you know, what their role is and why they're coming to see you, <laughs> you know, your things are running smoothly. Um, and it was great. Great. I know when Dr. Rice was there, um, he was over academics and now, you know, I'm a, you know, excited to see he's now, you know, the president of the campus. Mm -hmm. Hey, let me ask you, is food good in the military? I know there's always kind of rumors that, ah, it's bad. It's good. It's you know, what branch is the best. What branch are you in? Um, I'm army. Um, you know, I'm army, but surprisingly I was trained when I went to my food service school, Army Food Service School by Marine, but we make it good. Don't get me wrong. I mean, we, <laughs> we make it good. I mean, in 2012, I won my, my food service section, won the Philip A. Connolly Award, um, which is basically a competition that active duty National Guard and reservists have where every food service section basically competes. Well, this might be a great point to tell them about your new business. Well, it's not really that new, but we were in your retail store or factory and right now. And so maybe tell the listeners what it is you do, what store you own, and give us a little how you started it, which is pretty unique. Well, you know, like every, you know, C4 graduate, you have this dream of opening up a restaurant, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, being an executive chef somewhere on a golf course or in a hotel somewhere in New York or whatever, but... Um, I had quite a few business plans for different concepts, you know, just putting things on paper. But um, my wife and I have three kids and our oldest um, has a lot of food allergies, everything. Um, there's something with his immune system where it just attacks pretty much everything. So, but one of the few foods that he can eat is popcorn. So we were always making the popcorn for his lunch, for snacks road trips, everything. And I don't know how many air poppers I melted. I mean, seriously. And we just started making kettle corn. We said, you know, let's just, you know, make some, make some kettle corn. And we were just giving it, this was in New Orleans at the time. And we were just giving it away to coworkers and friends when they would come over. Um, keep in mind, this, this is like, this is in our house on a stove in a, in a, in a Kaflon pot. So we're making it, we're giving it away. 
then, then my, my wife is really, really pushing, hey, let's, let's scratch these other plans you got and let's, let's do this one. Like this, this should be easy <laughs> is what she tells me. You know, you can make a lot of things like you can make popcorn easy. So we got here in the fall and in December I deployed. But before I deploy, <clears throat> I gave her some to give to her, you know, her staff. Um, and then my wife is, an, is a nurse. So she took some to the hospital, things like that. Right. So I'm deployed. And she's like, hey, like people are, are, are placing orders on like sticky notes, texting her, all kind of stuff. Uh, and I, I pretty much resigned. Like once we decided to go for this, I just resigned. You know, I've been here ever since. So it worked out great. How did you pick the name? You know, I don't, it, it came to me. You know, we had a bunch of names that we gave to the focus group. And I don't even know how it came to me, but it just came to me. And it, it didn't win the, the tally. But the reaction from people were like, hot sugar pop. Like, what is that? But what is that? I didn't tell them what it was. And so it stuck with them. So I said, you know, let's just go with this. Let's just go with this name. And people, you know, always want to come and talk to me about how we set up our branding. And I, and I tell them all the time, I don't, I don't know. We just <laughs> had a name. happened. Just happened. So, Right. And we, you know, we went to, we went through a local guy, um, to do the logo they, you know, everybody talks about it, but I told him, you know, we just don't, I don't know how it just kind of fell into place. Now, um, I love popcorn and I'm sure people do that are going to be listening to this. Can, can you, can you buy it online? Do you have re retail? I mean, is there a website? Oh yeah. We, right. We started on um, the website is www.hotsugarpop.com. So we started, uh, online. Uh, with e -com. So we've always had a website. Plan was, because my wife has active duty, right? So the plan was to have an e -com store so that we can take it with us when she PCSs. But, you know, opportunities kept coming and we decided to take advantage of them. I guess we have the popcorn is available online. Um, and then we have, you know, wholesale accounts. That's pretty much where, you know, where we are right now. What was the website link again? It's www.hotsugarpop.com. Thinking about culinary school and all the time you spent there and the money and the classes and all these professors, would you do it all again? Of course. Would you change anything? Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. I, I would definitely do it all again. Definitely go back to Miami again. Um, you know, and you know, mine was great because it was a small campus. You know, I, I just, I mean, it, it was, it was, I did so much um, in in school. It was just great uh, being able to hang out uh, with all of the um, chefs all the time. You know, I, I was there when Chef Moscow was the dean of culinary education. When Chef James was the dean of education, and they were just so smart. You know, I mean, these guys were so smart, um, and just being around them. You know, again, helped me realize that, okay, you need a little bit more than just, you know, being able to, you know, sear and saute and, you know, blanch, you know, to be successful. So you had to run a business. Right. Right. They had a big influence on me. Um, you know, Sean Ray was there, um, still there. When I came there, he ran um, Res Life when I was there. But, you know, a lot, a lot I don't even remember who's, I, I think that the name of the instructors used to be on the website. Last time I checked, they were removed. So I don't, I don't know who's who's still there, uh, but I've been telling uh, Sean Ray and uh, uh, Chef Montello that I plan to take a trip down there and just, cause I know the campus has changed so much. I mean, it, it was changing rapidly when I was there, but you know, I just, it was just great um, being there with the instructors, leading students, learning. You know, Chef Montello um, was also a great mentor, even though I didn't have him for any classes, um, but he was just, uh, um, just a really uh, cool, approachable uh, um, of guy when I was there. Matter of fact, I, I've been talking with him more, re more, more frequently because I asked him to recommend a, a chocolate tempering machine because we were, we're making bonbons now and uh, popcorn candy bars and we're doing different infusions with the caramel. Um, so I've been, I've been hitting him up um, for some recommendations and I'm actually in the process of putting together a business plan for um, a restaurant with a quiche concept. So I know Chef Montello is like a, a, a pie crust extraordinaire. So I asked him for, you know, for a, rec a recipe for pie crust, which he gave me. Um, and now, of course, my kids are asking me to teach them, teach them, and you know, like, well, you should, maybe you should go to the school where I went, you know, but I'm, I'm teaching my daughter right now. Do they want to follow your footsteps? Do they want to go to culinary school, be chefs? You know, my, my daughter, 
loves to, to bake. I mean, she's nine. Um, my son does his thing now. Um, but, you know, I, I'm teaching them, but I'm teaching my daughter a little bit different than I'm teaching my son. You know, my daughter wants, wants, wants to bake. So, for example, my daughter, I, I made her, you know, I'll make her look up, uh, like, for example, a couple nights ago, her homework assignment was eggs. I said, you need to look up eggs and you need to tell me everything about what an egg does when you add it to something. Um, the white, the yolk, you know, what its purpose is in the recipe. And then, you know, we move on to sugar and then we move on to butter and I have a journal. So I say, well, you know, when you look at something and you see what's in it, you need to know what, it, what, it, what, it, what it's doing, you know, what its purpose is. And it took me a while to figure that out while I was in school. Because in school, man, you know, you just want to get a good grade because you got nine days, right? <laughs> my nine days in master stocks and sauces, continental American meat cutting, all that stuff. So, you, you know, you're focused on not messing up. But, you know, later on, it, just, it begins to all come together. The, the, the science behind it, the chemistry behind it begins to, you begin to see it now. Okay, this is why I do this. This is why I do that. But uh, hopefully they will, you know. Um, what is the future for you? Where do you see yourself in the long run? You know, five years, 10 years. Where do you, where, where you where's your, the path taking you these days? You know, I, I, I want to go back to JWU. You know, uh, Dr. Rice, when you first um, took the position, you know, reached out to me and asked me if I wanted to come back. But you know, with my wife being active duty, I wasn't able to do that. And it's always been, you know, a goal to go back in some capacity. And my wife talked about it all the time because she was with me my last year, you know, just going back to Florida. But Maybe being a teacher, instructor. And you know, something, you know, something, uh, you know, if they have any entrepreneurial classes or, you know, I, I kind of go with the natural, natural flow of things, the way opportunities come. So we'll see where this goes. But you know, we do, uh, people are already asking us, okay, well, where's your second location going to be, which we don't know yet. But right now we're doing a lot of collaborations with breweries, which has been a lot of fun. So, wow, yeah. Because, you know, North Carolina, so there's about 200 craft breweries in North Carolina. So it's basically the craft brew capital, you know, on the East Coast next to Oregon, you know, on the West Coast as far as number of breweries. Wow, didn't know that. We're, we're collaborating with them. You know, I was like, you know what? Let's just add some beer to, to our caramel. And we added beer to our caramel. And one of the, the brewery found out about it. And they were like, hey, you need to come to the brewery. I went there. You know, I gave them a tin of it. And they loved it. And then they gave me about 12 cases of beer. And I said, hey, keep making it for us. You know, bring it to us. They were so excited. So we're like, wow, you know, maybe we'll move on to, you know, well, let's make another different caramel. Great idea. How long how long is the shelf life for the popcorn? The bags have a a foil, a foil lining and then the brown bag. So once we seal it, it'll it'll last over a year. You know, plus the plus the kettle corn, the sugar helps preserve it a little bit as well. So I mean, we tell people the shelf life is three months. Now you've figured it all out and you've gone through this, you'll be easy for your second operation. Or if you ever decide to franchise, you'll have it all figured out. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That I mean, that'll be the easy part. We'll see what happens. You know, I wonder if I could open one on campus and then just have the money go toward like a scholarship or something, you know, um, that, that will be a plan, you know, for the future. I would, I would love to have. Maybe to start, just sell packages like in one of the little stores, the Starbucks places and the packages could go to scholarship. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's, that's one thing that, that I said, Hey, you know, maybe when I come down to kind of visit, uh, maybe for like one of the anniversary events they have, I'll kind of, you know, shoot the idea past Dr. Rice. Cause, we, Cause that's something that we would invest in. But again, you know, the plan and my wife knows is to come back in some capacity. We'll see, you know, whether it's an entrepreneurial class or. Well, to start, get you on campus just to talk as an alumni to some of the classes or the business classes and entrepreneurial classes. Well, it sounds like you're doing great. Keep it up. That's what's great about the culinary arts because that skill level, you don't know where life is going to take you, but you have the tools with you from your education and your, and your knowledge that you can adapt to anything. Popcorn, country club, hotel, food truck. Well, maybe you could give, um, maybe you give some advice. What would you say to someone that wanted to go to culinary school and they came to you? What would you, what would you tell them? What would you share with them? You know, some will say you don't need to go and, you know, you can just go work somewhere which is what you can, the, the di diverse group of instructors you're going to come across and the students that you're going to meet, I, I, I believe it's worth it. And I would just say, you know, take your time. I would be patient. You know, it, it takes some time to, you know, learn how these, how these 
um, ingredients come together and work. Taste everything and anything you can. And, uh, you know, if you have an opportunity to do something on the side with an instructor, man, do it because that's where, that's where I really, you know, they really kind of polished me up on those nights where, you know, I'm helping somebody plate, you know, I, I didn't care what it was, you know, you know, if I'm plating something, you know, or whatever, um, that's where you really kind of get to see uh, and hear some things you're just not going to see in class. Sure. Well, as we come to the end of our chat today, and before we wrap up, is there any last minute advice from, you know, just life in general, guidance, something about entrepreneur business that you want to leave with the listeners, something you want to share? Um, you know, it's good to have a plan, but be be flexible um, and, and, you know, and be able to recognize, you know, opportunity. If, if, if you're so, if, you know, there's, there's, there's multiple paths you can take to get to where you're going. Um, so don't, don't close yourself off, you know. Cool. Well, great talking to you. Thank you for all your time. I know you're busy there and stuff. And to, and to give us this time, it's, it's really, uh, we appreciate it. Oh, yeah. It was, it was a pleasure sharing some stories with you. Well, that is just about all the time we have for this episode. And I want to first thank you, Will, for coming on the show today and sharing your culinary school story with us. We really appreciate your insight and your honesty and your, your time with us and sharing uh, your knowledge. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Great to see you again. Great to see you and all the best. I'll be buying some of that popcorn. All right. <laughs> all right. Take care. Be safe. All right. And a big thanks and appreciation also goes out to all of you, the listeners. We hope you enjoy the show and this episode. You all are a big part of this show, so please let us know what you think. Your comments are always welcome, and they help us in making the best show possible. You can email them to culinaryschoolstories at gmail.com. That's culinaryschoolstories at gmail.com. Or even leave us a voicemail at area code 207 835 1275. That's area code 207 835 1275. And if you like the show, we have a big ask of all of you, and that is to share the podcast with everyone you know and to give us a positive rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Okay, until our next culinary school story, take care and be well. Bye-bye.